Hi, I'm Monica Weitzel. Welcome to Community Hotline at Home. Racial equity has been front and center of the local and national conversation for months. Have you ever wondered what you can do? We'll find out how we can all take a more active role in showing up for social justice issues and get involved in ways that can really make a difference. With us today is Emily Kruger, a facilitator who's been working as part of the multiracial movement for Black Lives since 2015. Welcome to the show, Emily. Thanks, Monica. It's great to have you here. You know, um, there's, there's a lot in the news lately about social justice issues, and I know that you've been working on this for a long time. Can you tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing right now in that area? Yeah, definitely. So I'm a part of a grassroots um, kind of informal uh, group of folks called Showing Up for Racial Justice, which is specifically white people organizing other white people in a multiracial movement. So we work in partnership with black and indigenous people of color led organizations. How did you get involved in that work? And this yeah. is volunteer work on your part, right? Right. So Showing Up for Racial Justice has a national organization that is, you know, some, some paid staff, but the vast majority of us are doing chapter work uh, in different cities around the country, different rural areas around the country, and everyone's unpaid. And it's, um, yeah, like I said, incredibly grassroots. I got involved actually in Portland when I uh, used to live in, <laughs> in that area a few years back um, in 2015. I'd been politicized I would, around the issues of racial justice, I would say, in college, um, growing up as a white woman in the progressive Bay Area. I definitely had the colorblind narrative of like, oh, we're past that, or oh, racism is just in the South. Um, but I didn't have many friends who weren't white. I didn't have many friends who weren't from the affluent neighborhood that I was from. And so going to college and taking coursework that allowed me to learn more about the history and, and current systems and, and how things really work. Uh, in addition to finally really meeting and being around people who are of different backgrounds than myself and having friends who are black look at me and say, no, this is real, this is happening, this is happening right now, even in the Oakland, you know, Berkeley area. And yeah, I just since then have been curious about how to be involved. And 2015 was when Michael Brown was murdered and I think similar to this moment there was this kind of national awareness and for a lot of white folks a sudden like oh we should care about this and so yeah. that was back when I got involved with Surge was in 2015. You know I, I think college is a is a place where a lot of people sort of get their eyes open to to what's going on because we don't learn about this stuff in grade school and middle school and high school. I mean it's very rare to have that you know the, the real history of our country um, talked about I think so when you find out about it it's kind of shocking um, but the fact that you're doing something about it is is a, a big deal and you're, and you're right um, with Michael Brown's stuff there was there was a big uproar about it and there have been many since then but somehow this is bigger this is bigger this time I mean I think that maybe it's the culmination what do you think do you do you yourself have a, a feeling for why this is so different now? This year with the pandemic, obviously folks were, um, I think maybe more attuned to some of the issues just generally in this kind of 2020, yeah. it's an election, right? We have Donald Trump as our president, right? Like I think yeah. there's yeah. been a um, broader uh, awareness that I think for a long time, status quo seemed for most folks like it was okay, even though there were many, many people saying it wasn't. Um, but now I think more and more there's more folks realizing well status quo isn't all right and so in the middle of a pandemic in the middle of all these folks being unemployed what's going on now with the you know the post office and the election right like yeah. to have to watch someone who is black be so brutally murdered by a police officer even though we know that's been happening and happening all the time to see it in this moment it's just such a groundswell of like, wait, this is not okay. And no. so that, that seems to me like what's going on. So yeah. now you're, you're in Washington, DC, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? And we're in Portland. In Portland, we've had, we've had protests every single night since um, the murder of George Floyd. But what other ways can, can white people get involved? How can we be an ally to the black community um, in ways that can make a positive difference? You know, for every person, it's gonna look different. I know we, I think what tends to happen, especially for white people who've been socialized to like be productive and be, I mean, not just white people, all people in culture in this US, like be productive, be, um, 
right, do it now, be urgent about it, right? Like people are looking for answers. So I want to acknowledge like the nuance and the challenge of this question you just asked me is like, I can't prescribe to people like, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do it tomorrow. This is how you do it, right? Like I have to preface anything I say with like, it's really complicated and it's gonna be different for each person. So that's my preface. Um, With that, there are certain things, of course. Like I think people can, I mean, the main thing I think a lot of white folks are doing right now, and I think it's something that I hope they're starting to do and will never stop doing is this like learning, right? Like learning and listening and, and trying to be empathetic to an experience that you as someone with white skin in this country will never have. Um, and that there's a lot of different experiences. It's not just about interactions with police officers. It's your interactions every day with this society. And so, um, yeah, learning, listening, reading, trying to actually talk with people in your life. Hopefully you have some people of color, black people in your life you can talk with. Um, And outside of learning and listening, I mean, yeah, it depends on what your passions and your interests are. Like if you want to be political, then be involved in campaign work, be involved, you know, there's phone banking, there's to voters, there's phone banking to politicians, you know, putting pressure on your city council. What's the budget? What's, where's the money going? What, what are you supporting? Right. So you can get involved that way. But for a lot of people, they're not into that, right? Like, and that's okay. You don't have to be some hyper political person to still be engaged. It might be through art. It might be through teaching other people. Um, it might be through fundraising, moving money. If you don't have that yourself, can you motivate other people? Um, yeah, there's so much. And the biggest thing I really think is to just listen to the folks who are leading us right now, because the ideas are there. The political stuff is there. The economic stuff is there. The social stuff is there. We just have to listen and get on board. So well, listen and, and let them lead. Yeah. Right. I mean, absolutely. I think that um, a lot of times we, and I speak for myself, tend to assume certain things about a certain community or we'll, or we'll think we know what's best. Whereas probably if we just shut up and listen a little more, then maybe they'll tell us what's best or what they need, right? Absolutely. And that doesn't mean that you, that as someone who is white in a movement for racial justice, like that you can't have a voice and you can't like, right. like I'm here today speaking, um, not on behalf of anyone, on behalf of myself in a, a collaboration with, with black and people of color. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it's very clear to me that you listening doesn't mean also that you're passive. And so being able to kind of balance those things. Are there certain mistakes you think people have made trying to do the right thing? I mean, I know that I have made mistakes before where I've tried to ask somebody a question like I ask you about why do you think it's different this time? But I asked of a black person and they flipped it on me and said, uh, that's really something you should answer. <laughs> mm. And I get that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, I, I get that. So what are some of the things that people maybe have misconceptions about or, or make mistakes when they're trying to do the right thing? Mm. Well, my initial reaction to this one is that like, I find with a lot of the people who are white in my life, which is most of my friends and of all of my family, um, and who are mostly identify as liberal Democrat progressive, right? Like they in that fear of making mistakes, like will not say or do anything. And I think it really hinders them from being in relationship with people who are not white. Uh, And so it's a weird thing because I, you know, I, you don't want to cause harm and we have to make space for making mistakes. And I think that fear of uh, saying the wrong thing, um, not being perfect, those stop us that that keeps us passive it stops us from engaging and so i think i don't this isn't going to answer your question exactly but my maybe advice would be like uh be okay with making mistakes and and especially a mistake if it's something that does cause harm um just address that and and say sorry and 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 be accountable to the person you harm or the people you harm and work with them to find, I mean, that's restorative justice. That's kind of what this abolitionist movement is about is like, instead of punishing someone for making a mistake and being like, God, you horrible white person, you're such an idiot. 
like I think in general, the movement is looking to say, hey, no, you know, if this white person says something harmful to a person of color or a black person, like, that's okay. It's not okay, but it's okay. Like, let's, and let's address that and let's deal with it instead of never even putting yourself out there to have the interaction in the first place. Um, oh, actually, I think that's a really good answer because it, I mean, we have to learn from our mistakes, right? And that's, that's the only way to do it is to make them first and then you learn from them. So yeah. I, I, think that, I think that's a really good answer is just not be afraid to, not be, and not be afraid to speak up and talk. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes we just need to talk to people and listen to what they have to say. And uh, right. yeah. Talk, yeah. talk and listen. And then if you talk and you say something harmful, like listen to, some, like check your defensive. Like, you know, it's really easy to be like, well, I didn't mean to. It's like, well, but it caused harm. So just, accept that and then we move forward and i hope that as people if you do something that makes someone upset like the example you gave um that that doesn't stop you from continuing to engage with people because then if we just retreat back and we don't continue to work together it's just not gonna happen yeah we've made no progress then yeah yeah so are there other resources you can think of that people who are interested in in educating themselves um should or could go to as a, you know, a, a way to learn? There's so much out there. I there, think there is. Yeah. I, I think my, my take on this kind of similar to what I mentioned earlier about like how you're going to get involved or how you're going to take action. I think also the, how you're going to learn is going to be specific to each person. So I can't prescribe like you need to read yeah. this and you need to do yeah. this. Like it has to be each individual an individual in community with their people, whether it's your partner or your neighbors, friends, parents, grandparents, whoever, your children, um, like finding out what works for you and for each other for your learning. Um, and yeah, it might be, you just have to get on the internet and like figure out what it is you're wanting to learn about. Like, you know, I've, I'd spent so many years kind of learning more about what it means, like whiteness and, and, like starting to name race more often, like that was a big thing. And now I feel like, okay, I've moved through that. And now I'm studying abolition. There are people who, there are professors and people who've worked forever and and not just, yeah, it's not just academia. It's like the people, the practitioners, people who've been incarcerated, like all these folks who've done incredible amounts of thinking and reading and writing around abolition of police and prisons. And so that's where I'm at. That's what I want to listen to. That's what I want to learn about. But that's probably not what everyone else wants to learn about right now. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a good point. I know, I know I've, I have um, some friends who are the older white crowd who um, get very defensive about white prejudice. They mm-hmm. don't, they don't understand, they don't understand that concept because I think they've worked very hard all their lives and they, I mean, not white prejudice, white privilege. White privilege, sure. White privilege. And they think, no, I'm not privileged, you know, and they don't, they don't really understand the concept of it. And that's, you know, so I think, you know, that's always a good place to start, you know, to understand yeah. that, but. Um, yeah, totally. And there, there's so much out there. And if it's, and again, this is like, maybe you like listening to podcasts, maybe you like scrolling Instagram, maybe you like reading whole chapter books, maybe you like reading history, like, so it just depends on maybe you want to, you know, consume art, like it, it just depends on on who you are and what works for you. And I think, in terms of also like in terms of taking action and learning, like finding things that are local to, to your area. And like, there are radical black and people of color led organizations all over this country and mm-hmm. some of they're, they're all a part of a national movement but like find those local folks like what are they asking you to do what resources are they putting out there um and it's it's out it's out there yeah. it's hard to find it first but once you do once you're in it and you start knowing some people and knowing some of the names of the organizations it's yeah it's easy from there so just to, to kind of wrap it up what what do you think um, is the m- most important thing people should take away from this conversation? What, what do you want people to know about being a white ally to the black community yeah. or to any, any other community for that matter? Yeah, I wanna raise the, the idea of collective liberation. So in a lot of this like justice work for all those different kind of marginalized groups that you just named, which also like, there's intersections, right? Like there are white people who are 
trans, there are white people who are um, queer, there are Latinx people who also maybe are identify as having African descent, right? It's complicated. Anyways, and so on that note, like, oh my God, and even to the point of like older people being like, I'm not privileged. It's like, right, because they have probably experienced some struggles too. That's what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. Even though we're saying, right, and you have these other privileges. So collective liberation is the idea that all of us are connected. And really, and we, when we say all of us, I mean humans globally. Right. And that all of our liberation, the, the ability to feel free is connected. And so to have liberation for the black community is to have liberation for everybody. Um, and that all of us are in this like together. And so I think the thing for me to have people take away is like to find your own why that you care about this, because if it's like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm a white person and I want to fight for racial justice for black people, for people of color. Reframing that to be like, no, I want to fight for racial justice for me because this is so deeply oppressing people that don't look like me and have a different experience than me, but that affects me and that affects my ability to be in relationships with those people, to be in this community and this society, like this community of humans. Um, and it kind of stops the like othering, right? And starts to see us as a, a collective. Yeah, do it for the human race, don't, don't yeah. do it. Yeah, and it's a hard thing. Like that took, it took me a long time to kind of find my why and find the language around it. Um, and I do identify as a queer woman. And so I have, you know, initially I was kind of brought into activist justice work through that lens of like, oh, well, I feel like I'm, because I identify as gay that I wanna be a part of movement work. Um, but then really realizing it was so much more complicated than that. Like, yeah, that, yeah. that collective liberation was more than just my queerness. It was like my humanness is actually, I personally think kind of oppressed, like the way our society works. I want it to yeah. be different for all of us. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I want it to be different too. I, th I think right. we're on the right path. I hope we are. Um, and I appreciate people like you that are really going deep and, and you know spending so much of your time and energy trying to help make things better. So I really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I um, enjoyed talking with you. So we will be talking again soon. But um, in the meantime, just keep on working. Awesome. And okay. all of you at uh, that are watching out there, please um, stay safe out there. Stay healthy and get involved. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.